IFIMAC ICMM seminar today from the Instituto de Ciencia de Materiales de Madrid, where we are very happy to see each other in person. I am Maria Jose Calderón and I will be chairing the session today. For those of you who are online, if you have any questions, please use the chat to make them. And at the end of the seminar, you can raise your hand and you will be able to ask your questions in person as well. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Uh, he is uh, uh, Professor Jacobo uh, Santa Maria from Universidad Complutense de Madrid, uh, where he's the director of the group of physics of complex materials. Uh, Jacobo is a condensed matter experimental physicist, an expert on quantum materials, in particular on oxide nanostructures and nitrostructures with magnetic, ferroelectric, and superconducting properties. He's currently a member of the editorial board of Physical Review Materials, a fellow of the American Physical Society and a Dannenberg Fellow of the uh, Université uh, Paris-Saclay. Uh, today, uh, Jacob is going to tell us about an extremely long range Josephson effect across a half metallic uh, ferromagnet. Can't wait to hear your story, so thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Maria Jose. And I want to thank you, I mean, heartfully for, for inviting me to this seminar, to the, this very prestigious seminar series. I'm delighted to be here. For many reasons, in fact. I mean, I've, I've spent the last two years in the kitchen at home, right? <laughs> so having the opportunity to exit is, is fantastic. Right? So, okay, uh, my talk, my talk today is uh, about. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an old topic. I mean, it's old physics, new results on an old physics. I want to talk about uh, proximity effect between. Uh, uh, ferromagnets and superconductors, ITC superconductors, right? So this work has been done, has been done, I'm trying to switch transparency, but it's not working. Hold on a second. Okay. No. Or maybe it's the battery or it's not on. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, because it's, 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 I'm focused here, thank you. So, so, so the thing is, I mean, this, this has been done in my group at the University Complutense in Madrid. This is a time integrated picture. I mean, this is a lot of, I mean, the group is smaller than this, but we got together a bunch of people for a PhD defense. Uh, so, Mm, but I like this picture very much. Right? So uh, uh, let me tell you just a few words about the activities in, in our group. We, we do basically transition metal oxides and we are interested in correlated physics at uh, interfaces, uh, artificial interfaces of these oxides. Right? And we have uh, ongoing research and in problems in magnetism, uh, superconductivity, spintronics, and spin orbitronics. Uh, I have to get closer. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm very happy to be here. Particularly, I mean, a, a bit. I'm, I'm 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 feeling a bit at home when I'm here because we are a mixed unit with this with this institute, right? And uh, we have a long-standing interaction with the group of Mar García Hernández for already many years in experimental uh, physics, and uh, also with theory groups, the theory of surfaces, interfaces, and nanostructures with Carmen Muñoz and the, the group of theory of quantum materials with Maria José Calderón and Luis Bray. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me tell you few, just a few words. I'm sure you know it about these transition metal oxides. It's a wide family of materials and they can host almost uh, every possible electronic state of the solid matter. I mean, this includes metals, insulators, superconductors, ferromagnets, multiferroics, et cetera, long, et cetera, right? And uh, due to this correlated physics, the, the, the electronic degrees of freedom are strongly en entangled. So this gives rise to a complex uh, coupled response under external perturbations, right? So this allows for very, I mean, very, very 
very sexy properties, say, right? And uh, there is, I mean, there is the hope, many of us hope that there will be an oxide electronics at some point in the future based on these materials. You probably have seen many times these this color palettes uh, uh, outlining the technological potential of these materials, which in a sense uh, reminds the uh, uh, Kabbalistic symbols of the, of the old alchemists when they were trying to convert iron into gold, right? And in a sense, this is what we aim in this, in this project, right? We want to convert, I mean, loosely sp speaking, we want to make a ferromagnet superconduct, right? So uh, the, vision, the vision that we have in our group is that bringing these materials together are interfaces. I mean, there may be interesting new uh, electronic phases, which, I mean, we may be able to manipulate externally, right? So we have a strong, strong activity in the electronic properties of this interface. <clears throat> so uh, as it turns out, uh, many of these oxides uh, share a common perovskite structure. So it is possible to combine them in, in highly perfect interfaces that you grow epitaxial. Right? And you can bring to compete or uh, uh, very different ground states. Like, for example, in this case, uh, 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 a superconductor and a ferromagnet, a half metallic ferromagnet. And this is what the, this talk is, is uh, uh, about today. No? So we want to examine the ferromagnetic superconducting proximity effect in a cuprate manganite. Uh, a nanostructure, and we want to demonstrate an extremely long range uh, Josephson coupling between the two superconductors across a half metallic ferromagnet. And when I say, and I say an extremely long range, it means really, really long. I mean, it means one micron length scale at relatively high temperatures. Right? Uh, so, as I told you, this has been done in, in, in my group. Uh, and the main characters, I'm sorry, the main characters in this research is this guy, who is David Sanchez Manzano, who finished his PhD about one year ago. And this other guy over here, Mirko Rochi, maybe you remember him because he was waiting, were, uh, waiting I'm sorry, was working in, in, in this institute for quite a long time, many years ago. So there has been two PhD theses in a row on these topics. Uh, as I will uh, explain in a moment. Um, I, I mean, you, you may see many of the main players in, the, in this game, in this picture. Here's Javier Villegas, he's in, in, in France, and here's Mar, you may recognize her. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, this has been a, collaborate, a, col a collaboration between uh, the, our group and uh, Mariona Cabero and Jose Gonzalez Calvet in the National Microscopy Facility in our campus, uh, Federico Monpean and Mar Garcia, this institute, uh, the group of Javier Villegas and uh, Unité Mix de Physique, Tenerestales, the group of Jérôme Lesueur, the, 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 the Université Paris Sorbonne, and uh, Alexander Bustin, Université Bordeaux and Sergi Valencia and his uh, collaborators at the synchrotron BESI. Okay, so singlet, uh, singlet superconductivity and ferromagnetism are antagonistic phenomena. I mean, it had, this has been already known for, for many years and uh, uh, the exchange uh, field of the ferromagnet uh, tends to depress the, the superconductivity, right? Uh, so that's the reason why, I mean, there is very, very few examples of mm, ferromagnetic superconductors, I mean, mm, uh, uh, singlet superconductors, right? There is a, an, an, an example recently published a couple of years ago. This is an europium, europium iron arsenide. It, would, uh, it has localized moments which uh, have a very weak intertalk with the conduction electrons, right? And this allows for the consistency of both phenomena, right? Uh, but on the contrary, triplets, which I mean, they may they, they may exist, right? These triplets, uh, if they are equal spin, they may coexist with ferromagnetism uh, peacefully, right? And 
but this, I mean, triplet superconductivity has been found very rarely in, in bulk samples either. I mean, with well-known exceptions in uranium compounds uh, uh, examined by uh, Jacques Floquet. Huh? <clears throat> but in the, in the, the framework of the, of the proximity effect, these uh, uh, triplets can be generated quite, quite naturally. Uh, in the proximity effect, uh, when a superconductor is placed in contact with a normal metal, the pairing amplitude penetrates into a normal metal over distances, which may be quite long at low temperatures. The microscopic mechanism is the Andreev reflection by which an, an electron, say, uh, spin up, is uh, retro-reflected as a whole with opposite spin. Right? This is these are the Andreev pairs. There is, they are phase coherence, right? And there is a pairing amplitude uh, uh, due to this phase coherence of the Andreev pairs induced in the, in the normal metal, right? Now, if the normal metal is a ferromagnet, the, the length scale for this uh, uh, pairing amplitude is considerably reduced due to the effect of the, of the exchange field, right? But um, looking at the Andreev pairs, in the ferromagnet, one is spin up, the other is spin down, they have to pertain to different bands, right? As a result, there is a momentum, there is a center of mass momentum in the, in the pair. So the, the wave function of the pair is like this, right? Which, I mean, can be, I mean, it can be shown very easily that it can be decomposed in a, in a singlet component, in a triplet component. And this triplet is not the triplet we're looking for. This is a triplet with zero uh, uh, z-spin uh, 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 momentum, right? But uh, the pioneering result came in the early 2000s, where Sebastian Bergeret, Anatoly Volkov, and Konstantin Efetov showed that these uh, zero-spin triplets can be converted into an equal-spin triplets by an helical uh, magnetic inhomogeneity. Uh, this was shown in weak ferromagnets. I mean, this, this is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a theoretical study, right? And uh, uh, basically uh, they need that the one over the scattering time is the longest energy scale of the problem, even longer than exchange. So that's the reason why they need weak ferromagnets. So, but on the contrary, the, the length scale over which this conversion occurs is relatively long, right? But it was immediately, I mean, a few years after, uh, Matthias Estrich, Juan Carlos Cuevas, and, and Gerd Schoen, they, 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 they show that uh, also in strong ferromagnets, even half metals, this conversion into uh, equal spin triplets can occur. Right? Now it occurs at much shorter length scales, right? And for a half metal, this length scale can be as short as atomic distance, right? It's a spin flip scattering event, right? So basically, I mean, the, the, the idea is that a, a magnetic inhomogeneity converts zero spin triplets into equal spin triplets, right? And this can even, I mean, this is, does not need to be in, in real space. It can be even in momentum space in materials with strong spin orbit interaction as shown by, by, by Berger a, a little later. It's, it's quite interesting that the, the main players in these two papers and the, all these physics ended up uh, being in Spain. <laughs> Sebastian Berger is at the Donostia Physics Center in, in San Sebastian and Juan Carlos Cuevas is, is, is at the University of Autonoma, right? So, uh, so basically what happens is that this magnetic inhomogeneity rotates the quantization axis, the uh, axis, right? And as a result, the zero spin triplets are projected into equal spin uh, components, right? And uh, this, I mean, this, this equal spin uh, uh, triplets I mean, open the way, I mean, for, for quite interesting applications in superconducting spintronics, as it has been discussed in a number of, I mean, very good review papers that you may be interested in, in reading. 
but uh, in addition, this, this uh, uh, triplets uh, superconductivity has uh, interesting Im implications in the in the symmetry in the symmetry of the pairing, right? Because as the wave function has to be an odd function uh, under the exchange of the of the electron coordinates uh, uh, according to the Pauli exclusion principle, right? So if you need the proximity effect to be long range, the pairing has to be isotropic, right? And isotropic means, I mean, mm, in principle, S wave. It, it could be, could be, could be different, but in principle, say S wave, right? S wave is a even function in the orbital sector. Triplets is even in under the, 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 the exchange of the spins. So for the wave function to be odd, you need the, to be an odd function of the energy, or it has to be odd frequency, odd frequency, which essentially means if you want things in the time domain, that electrons will, with the same spin of the pair, will avoid being at the same position at the same time, right? To comply with the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, so, um, Experimentally, there has been a number of evidences suggesting that these triplets, in fact, exist in practice, right? And this, I mean, this, this very well-known papers, this, this uh, 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 in chromium dioxide, which is also half metal, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, club weight group in, in, in Delft uh, uh, measured a long range uh, supercurrent over 300 nanometers. Right? And this was taken as a good evidence for the presence of triplets, right? Because as I told you, the, uh, uh, the long range of the, the I'm sorry, the, 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 the length scale of the proximity effect has to be very short range unless there is triplets in the pheromone, right? So, and uh, also in Cambridge, the, at that time, the group of Mark Blamayer, uh, now it's Jason Robinson's group, who was this? He was a PhD student. So he, he engineered this uh, triplet conversion uh, at the interfaces with an helical pheromone. And he again measured a long range supercurrent, right? And shortly after that, there was a theoretical idea by Alexander Bosdin that suggesting that this conversion and propagation of the triplets could be engineered in multi layers combining weak and strong pheromone. And this was again, I mean, this idea was followed by many, by many theorists, right? And uh, uh, it was experimentally realized in Michigan State University in uh, Norman Bates group, right? So essentially there is a strong uh, basis, right? Experimental uh, foundations for the existence of this triplet, but there is one thing missing. Right? The thing is that if there is, if there is this, if these triplets in fact exist, there should be also a long range Josephson effect. And this has not been shown, that has not been shown. Uh, uh, I mean, this remained elusive for some, for some reason, right? So the, the, the idea is that the Josephson effect is the, is the coupling of two superconductors across a barrier. The barrier may be an insulator, maybe also uh, uh, a metal uh, in, a, in a weak link, right? And uh, if there is long range triplets, if this metal is a ferromagnet, there should be a long range Josephson effect. And this was what we uh, were looking for, right? So uh, this, this uh, Josephson effect, this Josephson coupling gives rise to a phase coherent quantum state. So demonstrating Josephson effect implies demonstrate, demonstrating phase coherence. And this is uh, 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 shown by very characteristic interference effects, right? So the, the first is a lateral modulation of the critical current, which gives rise to a, 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 a spatial interference, giving rise to a characteristic dependence of the critical current on magnetic field, which is the Fraunhofer pattern, right? And uh, uh, there is a time evolution on the, of the phase under an applied voltage, which gives rise to uh, 
synchronization and phase locking under illumination with microwaves. This gives rise to the well-known Shapiro steps. So demonstrating Josephson effect um, requires showing Fraunhofer uh, modulation of the critical current and Shapiro steps. So this is the this this uh, this is the aim of this work. I mean, we want to uh, convince you that we are able to make these structures showing a long-range Josephson effect as demonstrated by Fraunhofer uh, uh, and Sapiro. Right? So, and the idea is, is making this 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 kind of structures. I'm right? very very simple. Right? Uh, manganite wire with two with two uh, 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 superconducting electrodes. But if you think that these materials to grow properly, they have. They, I mean, they 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 to have the. I mean, they require structure and ground states. They re, they, they they have to be grown at very high temperatures from typically eight to 900 degrees. So there is no, no process resist in nanofabrication that withstands this, this temperature. So is there, I mean, it's a complex experimental problem. I mean, and we were rocking our brains for actually many, many years trying to find how to make this simple thing just across, right? Just across with a lithography process. And I mean, we 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 didn't find better thing as making the thing the, the device ex situ, which I mean, uh, uh, probably everyone would have told you that the uh, chances of succeeding in this were practically zero, right? So, and um, so we what we do is we grow the, these materials using this non-standard high pressure sputtering technique in pure oxygen and 900 degrees temperature, right? That in single film, it, I mean, it produces fantastic materials and also heterostructures with very atomically sharp interfaces. And the reason to choose these materials was because over the years, we had uh, quite convincing uh, uh, fingerprints that these triplets might exist in this, in this system. So you may you may see in this paper, this is 2004. This is Vanessa Peña, one of my students. And uh, we found that uh, in super lattices, at that time, everyone was doing super lattices, right? And we, to, you may remember, Jose Luis, that we were measuring these things. So uh, uh, what we found is that changing the thickness of the ferromagnet, we got a, a, a modulation of the critical temperature in a wide thickness range of the ferromagnet. Right. So at that time, we interpreted this as a, a, a the, as an indication for a long range uh, uh, proximity effect. The, I mean, a bit speculative, to be honest. A bit later, Cristina Visani was another of our, our students. Uh, she was doing a postdoc with Javier Villegas in, in Paris, and uh, uh, we measured tunneling transport in bilayers. Right? And we found this uh, uh, oscillatory behavior at energies above the gap of the superconductor, which uh, scaled with the thickness of the ferromagnet. So these are Macmillan Rowell oscillations and demonstrate coherent transport in the ferromagnet. So this was taken as a strong evidence for the existence of the triplets. Right? And also, uh, uh, have Kalsheim in, in other Milo group in in, in Israel, we're able to measure a super, superconducting gap on top of the ferromagnet in bilayers or made of YBCO and manganese. So we were kind I mean, of convinced that, that these triplets uh, actually were generated at this interface. And that's the reason why this year, 2004, we really decided to pursue this, this Josephson problem, right? So, Mm, as, I, as I was telling you, the strategy is ex situ. We first mm, uh, do wires, manganite. We grow a manganite film. We pattern a wire with electron beam lithography, right? And then since there is no, no resist to be used as a mask, what we did is we engineered a mechanical mask with amorphous alumina, right? We, we developed a whole, a whole process to grow this amorphous alumina and make trenches 
by electron beam lithography, right? And uh, we deposit the, the, the YBCO in these trenches, right? YBCO growing on top of the alumina is a rock, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's amorphous and not strongly insulating, and the YBCO growing uh, in the trenches is, is epitaxially. Uh, it's epitaxial on top of the, uh, the manganite wire below. So in this way, we grow I mean, these devices. This is the idea, right? The two, two superconductors with one micron separation on top of the manganite wire. So, and we grow some of these things, uh, I mean, uh, uh, repeatedly on the same uh, uh, substrate, right? And uh, so the first question is whether the interface, since this is an ex situ process, if the interface has been degraded and this is uh, no good. So we uh, went to our friend, friends at the, at the uh, microscopy facility with one of these samples, and they managed to um, make a cross-section sample from microscopy in one of these uh, devices, right? And uh, uh, Eureka, right? So we got a, a atomically sharp interface, chemically and structurally, comparable to the ones grown in situ. I mean, from the material science perspective, this is an important result, say, right? And the idea, the idea is uh, probably is that since we are growing in a pure oxygen plasma and 900 degrees, every dirt that might be on top of the of the manganite wire resulting of the processing or whatever will be annealed out by this very strongly oxidizing uh, atmosphere of the growth. And so uh, we measured, I mean, one of these devices, we inject the current across the YBCO, we measure the voltage in the manganite. In the normal state, we get the typical shape of a manganite, but there is a I mean, a clear superconducting transition, right? And uh, when we look at this in a, in, a, in a log scale, there is orders of magnitude degrees of the resistivity as it should, right? So we, have a, we, we, we did endless control experiments to rule out artifacts, like, like uh, shorts between the YVCO wires. And we even did devices without manganite wire, right? To look for shorts. And, there was not, right? There was not. And uh, so we were convinced that we, <laughs> we had made the, 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 the manganite uh, uh, superconducting. So we looked for, I mean, a possible explanation that maybe the manganite has degraded, it is not magnetic. We went to the synchrotron and we did photoelectron microscopy with extra, a, a, a magnetic dichroism uh, 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 contrast. And we made sure that the manganite remained magnetic with this biaxial anisotropy uh, in the plane of the, of the wires. So uh, we measured the critical current. Right? Uh, remember that the separation between the YBCOs is uh, 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 electrodes, is, is one micron, right? We still measure the critical currents. It may appear quite large in this, in this picture over here. I mean, but if we, if we have a closer look, right, it uh, turns out that there is significant rounding, right? So the actual critical current is very low. It's very small, right? And uh, the, uh, of the order or below one, one microamp, right? Mm, so we, we had to use very, very ambitious voltage criterion to reach a nonlinear regime of the critical current and in the IV curves. This was challenging to measure, right? Uh, so the first question is, I mean, if these values of the critical current, whether these values that we're getting are realistic, they, do they make sense or not, right? Because I mean, having a weakling, such a long weakling in a ferromagnet is, I mean, opens a lot of, I mean, uh, uh, doubts, say. Right? So uh, we analyze this critical current in the framework of the SNS theory, right? The Likarev theory or Dubois theory that you may know, right? For um, superconducting normal superconducting weaklings, right? And we got 
a reasonable agreement with the prediction of this theory, right? That, that I mean, they may be, they may be not necessarily the, the case because I mean this is for not superconductor normal metal weaklings and we have I mean singlet superconductivity of course we have triplet superconductivity and a ferromagnet right but still we got I mean reasonable agreement with the with the theory and uh, somehow we were we were relieved because because one expects that the triplets in a equal spin triplets in a ferromagnet should behave similarly to a normal pair, singlet pairs in a normal metal, right? This is the, the, the idea, right? And the values that we get for the characteristic energy, which is the, which is the tallest energy, right? Uh, it was also reasonable, 100 microelectron volts, right? Which is comparable to, I mean, what other people have found with uh, uh, ferromagnetic weaklings, right? And we got the, we also obtained the correct scaling with the, with the with the length, I mean, with we change the length of the weakling, the separation between YBCO electrodes, we get a scaling of the uh, uh, tauless energy, which goes uh, as one over the separation square, as expected. So I mean, this somehow this makes makes a lot of sense. Say, so we wanted to look at the phase coherence. Then we. Uh, 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 the Fraun in the in the Fraunhofer pattern, the critical current, so this dependence, right, with the with magnetic field. This is this is magnetic flux uh, uh, across the junction. This is the the flux quantum. So every time the flux amounts a flux quantum, the critical current goes through zero, and this gives rise to the Fraunhofer pattern. But remember, the critical current was very small, so. Measuring the, the, the critical current was challenging. If you want to show that there is a modulation of this very small critical current, it's a mess. So we decided instead that instead of measuring the critical current, we measured slightly above the critical current, a resistance, which is still is, I mean, feels the critical current. And we changed the angle of the uh, magnetic field with, uh, uh, the the direction of the of the wire. I mean, in the end, this Fraunhofer pattern is a flux matching effect, and changing the angle uh, is is a way of closely probing the flux matching. So one expects. I mean, since uh, uh, the the idea is that when you when you rotate the magnetic field in the plane. Right, the magnetic field necessary to amount a flux quantum is angle dependent. Right, so you have you ended up uh, having two periodicities: one angular periodicity and one magnetic field periodicity. Right, remember that the critical current goes to zero for every flux quantum. Right, and uh, this is a simulation of what we expect according to the Fraunhofer expression. And this is what we measure, right? that we reproduce, I mean, consistently the angle periodicity and the magnetic field periodicity. This is differential resistance as a function of magnetic field for different angles, right? And uh, basically, what, what this is showing, maybe you see it better in the simulation, the, the period of the oscillation is the, is, is the is the shortest where the magnetic field is directed perpendicular to the junction because there is flux across the junction, right? And when the magnetic field is along the wire, there is no flux threading the junction and the periodicity goes to infinity. There is no periodicity, right? This is why we get these slopes, right? And this, this modulation of the period is what we got if we, if we look for individual resistance curves. We get that the, when the magnetic field is perpendicular to the wire, we get this rapid oscillation. And when the magnetic field uh, is parallel to the wire, the oscillation goes away. Right? So we take this as a I mean, good demonstration of uh, uh, Fraunhofer modulation of the critical current. And uh, uh, the, the, the information that we get from these simulations is that we can uh, work out the uh, uh, 
the, the effective area of the junction is this is given by the thickness of the wire this you cannot speculate is what it is what it is right 30 nanometers right and then there is the effective length remember that the separation between the YBCO was one micron and the, the, the effective length that we get is three micron is relatively long I mean we were a bit disappointed but but hold on a second so uh, again so if we go now to 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 time evolution of the phase and Shapiro steps under a, a voltage an applied voltage there is this time evolution of the phase this is the second Josephson equation and basically the voltage over phi naught is a frequency right it's a frequency and when this frequency here is a multiple of the microwave frequency and the radiation of the sample with with microwaves, right? There is phase locking. There is strong resonant absorption, right? And the 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 the, the sample goes to the normal state, and you see an increase of the resistance. And there is this this I mean, changing the voltage, right? Produces this uh, resonance conditions in which the sample goes to normal and produces these steps in the in the in the in the resistance, right? Which are the Sapiro steps, right? So Mm, we have measured this and we uh, in maps of the this is differential resistance as a function of current for different powers of the microwave frequency oh i'm sorry about the microwave uh, radiation at 10 gigahertz right and we get i mean there is no question there is here no one, the characteristic interference process and when we plot these maps as a function of voltage we get very clear Shapiro steps but interestingly this this these steps occur not at integer values of the of the uh, ratios of the voltage over the justice and voltage but half integer i mean there is a doubling this is the doubling of the periodicity right and doubling of the periodicity means that there is a dominating uh, second harmonic in the current phase relation this is, I mean, it's not completely surprising. I mean, this, the current phase relation is harmonic for normal, for weaklings, right? Mm, with normal metals at the critical temperature, but with ferromagnets, it has been shown in the past that they are, I mean, they may be uh, non-harmonic, right? And in fact, a dominating second harmonic has been shown in the vicinity of the zero pi transition in, in, in Josephson junctions with ferromagnetic barriers. So, so somehow this dominating second harmonic is a signature of, uh, of the ferromagnet. Of course, I mean, we, we, I mean this, is, this is a bit speculation because so far there is not a theory of the Josephson, of the Shapiro steps for Josephson junctions, for ITC superconductors and ferromagnetic barriers. But certainly, I mean, this is a, a consistent proof of uh, phase coherence. But now, if we, if we realize that there is a dominating second harmonic, if we go back to the interpretation of the Fraunhofer patterns, and we admit that there is a doubling of the periodicity due to the dominating second harmonic, the effective length that we get is instead 1.5 micrometers, which makes a lot of sense physically, right? Because there is a one micron separation, and then this length scale is increased by twice the London penetration depth, right? Due to the penetration of the magnetic field under the YVCO electrodes. And these numbers then make, I mean, make a lot of sense, say, uh, physically. So this brings me to the, to the, to my conclusion. Mm -hmm. I hope I, I mean, I have convinced you that we have demonstrated phase coherence over one micron in, in Josephson junctions made of uh, ITC and uh, superconductors and half metallic ferromagnets. Mm -hmm. This, I mean, uh, there, there is a strong of uh, anomaly in the, in the Sapiro step that calls for uh, theoretical investigation. And there is a very interesting outlook 
uh, I mean, um, this uh, this is a, a painting, a marriage of uh, uh, ferromagnetism and uh, the quantum coherence of the Josephson junction, right? And this not only opens the, the way to, to, a, to a superconducting spintronics. I mean, think now that the currents, the, 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 this, the super currents are spin polarized. So you can, you can I mean, uh, think of uh, interesting experiments uh, like, for example, in spin torque or whatever with super currents. But not only this. Now the uh, think that the phase that the phase depends on the on the magnetic state, on the domain state of the ferromagnet. So this now the memory, the, the memory, the reading of the, the memory is imprinted in the face of a Josephson junction. So there is there is, I mean, one can one could think of a, a, a quantum memory of a phase battery based on these effects, right? And a completely new concept of spintronics, which would be a quantum spintronics in the sense that the spin information is imprinted in the face of a Josephson junction. I mean, these are, I mean, now dreams, right? This, this, uh, uh, this results has been, I mean, uh, were accepted in Nature Materials. We're very happy with this and will be published hopefully in a couple of weeks. I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, there are questions. Uh, so you have to wait to have the mic. Here? Better from here? Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk and results, Jacobo. So I, I, I have a question about your Fraunhofer results. You mentioned that you actually go to the dissipative state to measure the Fraunhofer patterns. So I guess the, the point is that you cannot really measure the switching currents in your device in a kind of accurate manner, right? Because I, the following question would be that in principle, you could, you could detect the zero pi transition already in the switching currents of your device, right? But apparently you cannot. So, so how do you relate this dissipative state to the yeah. true critical current of the junction? Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me go back. Let me go back to this. Yeah, here. I mean, the the normal state resistance of the junction is over, of the order of one ohm, one ohm, right? And we are measuring. I mean, this is the the the, the modulation that you expect uh, 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 if you measure below the critical current, below the critical current. Uh, when the critical current goes to zero, the resistance of the device goes to the normal state resistance, one ohm, right? I mean, practically this is difficult to measure. So what we do is we measure slightly above the critical current, but the, we still feel the modulation of the critical current. Now, the, the, uh, this is resistance as a function of magnetic field. And you may see that at this level, the uh, uh, modulation of resistance right, <laughs> in the Fraunhofer oscillation is, I mean, is below one ohm, but you can measure. I mean, you can measure it, uh, no problem, right? So we are above the critical current, but we feel the critical current. Now, let me think of your question, whether this, this, this measurement would or would not feel a zero pi transition if it would happen. Let me think. Because in principle, the, the, there is a switching in the critical current. Mm -hmm. Depending on how you measure it, you would see a drop in critical current when you go to the pi phase. Right, right. That's the way, the way, I mean, let me, can I, can I, uh, maybe I go, I go, I go very quickly. Let me go. There was a transparency in the introduction showing the results of the zero pi transition that may help me to answer your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, way, the way people have measured in practice the zero pi transition is 
by a, a, a drop to zero of the critical current. This is the results of the Jan Arts paper, and this is the Contos de Marco Aprili paper. Right? And basically, they, they, claim, they claim a zero pi transition by this, this uh, by the critical current go, going to right, zero. Right. I think we, right. we, we may feel this, but this is not going to be a zero resistance state, but it's going to be a background resistance state. But we are able to tell if there is a zero pi transition, we should be able to tell. I see. Uh -huh. Actually, can you go in the, above the critical current and still feel? Exactly, exactly. You can go really above and still see this. No, thing. no, no. This has, I mean, this is tricky. I mean, if you go too much, uh, uh, too, uh, way too above the critical current, you lose this. You lose this. You cannot measure the resistance change. No, you, I mean, you may be above at a level that you can, I mean, comfort, comfortable uh, uh, measure, but uh, still feel the modulation of the resistance due to the changes in the case. Okay. But Thank you have you. to look for it. Eh? Thank you. I remember being at the airport <laughs> when we, 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 we were going to the March meeting, the March meeting both of us. And you said, the, 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 there has to be Majoranas in this, in this uh, Maybe there is. <laughs> yeah, we have to talk about. <laughs> okay. More questions or? Uh, there are a couple of questions from the audience in Zoom. Okay, so uh, they can make them now. Okay, so Juan Carlos, please go ahead. Hi, go on. It's great to see you. Great talk. Okay, so I'm really glad that you made it. I mean, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, are you Juan Carlos? I am, I am. I have to get on my knees. I mean, no, 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 please, please. <laughs> great talk, great talk. I have a simple question, okay? So you know that when it comes essentially to the Josun effect, one of the key parameters is the quality of the interface, right? And these are relatively different materials. So what can you say about the quality of the interface? Is yes. this a standard tunnel junction or could you have essentially yes. like high transmission channels? I mean, have you analyzed something like the conductors in the normal state? I mean, to try to guess essentially what is the quality of this interface between these two materials? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah, very important question. In fact, I mean, what I mean, of course, uh, I mean the the Josephson effect in principle is a two term, terminal device, and you measure across the interface, so you yeah. need the high transparency. Right? And we were not sure in principle whether we had it or not. So it turns out that the transparency, I mean, we, I cannot tell you a number, but I can show you that this is, is, is very high. And the reason is because we measure the same conductance, uh, uh, placing the voltage contacts on top of the YBCO or placing that measures conductance across the interface or placing the voltage contacts in the manganite that you don't feel the interface in the voltage measurement, right? And okay. we get the same, exactly the same conductance. So this means that the, that the transparency is, is very high, very high. Okay, Are you thank surprised? you very much. Are you surprised by a high transparency junction in this, in this system? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, it's something deep down to material science. Uh, I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell. Uh -huh. But I mean, what you're telling me is, is a proof that is a high transparency, okay? Uh -huh. So, and that might explain essentially this doubling of, of the Sapiro steps that you see, okay? Mm -hmm. Because even if it's a high TC, it's surprising essentially to see the doubling essentially of the frequency of the Sapiro steps. But uh, I mean, it's extremely convincing to me, okay? So congratulations for the results, really cool story, okay? Thank you very much, thank you. Well, there is another one, uh, Akash Deep, please. Uh, unmute yourself, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. I, I missed a little bit. Uh, I probably didn't understand a part of it. I wanted you to tell me once again, because we have a D-wave superconductor, so I'm a little bit confused why, how, how should that affect the, D, the front of a pattern? Because as far as I understand, even the experimental verification of uh, the YBCO having a D wave Cooper bearing has come from Fraunhofer pattern. So there's some unique signature that corresponds to this D wave feature. But to me, it seems you don't see any special D wave relevant feature here. Is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a key. That's a key question. That's a key question. Yeah. Afford, I mean, I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't I don't have an, an an experimental answer. I can tell you, I can tell you that that the painting that the painting. Uh, the, 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 the symmetry in the ferromagnet cannot be just a normal D wave because this should die uh, within a, 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 a mean free path, right? But uh, uh, fortunately, there is a paper by, by uh, uh, Efetov and Volkov in the year two. I, I, I have a transparency. Can you help me? I mean, or maybe I have it. No, 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 no. Don't worry. Don't worry, Maria Jose. I, I can reach it because, because somehow I was waiting, expecting this question because, because that's, 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 it's a very important. And I have a copy. I'm sorry for this. I cannot do it more efficiently. Uh, I have to go to the very end of my presentation because I, I have a couple of spare. Ah, okay, this. This, this, so the, in this paper, uh, they precisely address the, uh, how, how would be the pairing symmetry be, between a high TC and a, and a ferromark, right? And what they propose that in the same symmetry that we have, I mean, C axis uh, perpendicular to the ferromagnet, if there are, if there is a domain wall that we have plenty of it, Right, uh, 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 with its plane perpendicular to the superconducting layer, there is a mechanism of conversion of the D wave into S wave. Right. So, the, <laughs> my answer. I mean, there is a, a theoretical argument at least that there may be a conversion into S wave. Right. In the in the ferromagnet. Um. Um. Uh, we haven't measured it. Right. I think there may be other possibilities. I mean, there may be, you can reach an isotropic pairing uh, uh, state in the, in, with D-wave pairing if the, if the uh, 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 pairing is chiral. I mean, there is a complex, a complex uh, 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 say, dx x squared minus y squared plus y dxy, right? And this would also give you a rather isotropic pairing, but, but uh, I mean, which would allow for the long range, mm, but certainly it has to be demonstrated whether there is a, this, this chiral superconductivity or not in the system. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Are there more questions, Elsa? Are there more questions here in the audience? Not here. Well, okay, so really it was very impressive. Uh, I, I'm really so happy that, that you came and, and tell us this because it's uh, really great. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you everyone who was on the other side of the screen somewhere. And well, and well, we should clap again, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.